Uh, moving on to symbols. So I'm using symbols to denote uh, the overheads, but also the spot mics. Now, some people like to give really different treatment to the spot mics that are close up on the smaller symbols in the kit. Um, I tend to like to just treat them all at the same time, just kind of find a general blend that works. You can see here, just in terms of level, I've got my hi-hat mic turned way down. I'm not really using very much of that at all. The ride's a little bit more prominent, and if any of you have recorded live drums, you'll know that the rides, although they're quite loud in person, tend not to cut through into the overheads anywhere near as much as the crash cymbals and, and uh, hi-hats that you, you hear next to them. So the ride cymbal typically needs a little bit more help in the spot mics. Uh, and then I have the overheads channel here. So really when I'm thinking about overheads, I'm not trying to generate a lot of extra kind of beef for the close mics. Some people love to do that. Some people leave a lot of extra low end in the overheads and they kind of mix with the approach of starting with the overheads and filling in the close mics. And that's cool and it works for plenty of people. Uh, but for me, I prefer my overheads and, and my close mics on the cymbals to be more of like a, a cymbal mic uh, situation. Whereas the room mics perhaps are gonna give me more of the, the body of the actual shells too. So uh, in terms of processing on the, on the overheads, you can see I've jogged a huge uh, high pass filter up to 180 hertz here. Um, I've also cut a little bit around 500 that I guess sounded a bit boxy. This is the big one though. I think there's always an issue somewhere between about five to seven K with, um, with crash symbols in particular. They tend to have this huge, great big spike there that sounds very abrasive. Um, actually, perhaps the best thing I can do is I'll, I'll bypass that and I'll, I'll hit play on the overhead channel because this song is riding on the crash. You're gonna hear it straight away. And you're gonna see on the spectrum analyzer a great big hump occurring exactly where I've cut here. So. Uh, let's just take a quick listen to this overhead channel, which has the high pass filter and low pass filter on it, but uh, doesn't have this kind of uh, 6K cut there. So that's a really drastic change that you get when you engage uh, this EQ here. So I've got a big bell cut of 8 dB at 6K. And that immediately sucks away all of those very harsh sounding frequencies. I mean, um, for me, getting overheads right is all about that. Getting, getting the cymbals to sound right is all about that particular move. You know, you can mess with your high and low pass filters and other cuts, but if you don't find where the, the crash cymbals in particular are ringing out most harshly and cut there, it's gonna be really difficult to make your cymbals sound good in the mix, in my experience. So that's my EQ that I'm using on, on the cymbals. However, I am also notching out a particular ringing frequency in the crash, I think it was. If I, if I, if I leave this flat and then cut it, you'll hear, um, you'll hear just how much it's doing. So again, I'll hit play um, with this on and then I'll unbypass it and you'll suddenly hear this kind of whistling frequency appear in the overheads. You could drive yourself crazy finding every single frequency that needs notching and, and notching it out and end up with perhaps a slightly kind of uh, neutered sounding cymbal sound for your record. Uh, for me, I think that it's important just to focus in on the one or two that are most abrasive and cut those. So here, that was that particular frequency that, that I found um, to be abrasive. And it's a bit of a skill that you need to develop to be able to hear that, um, you know, to listen to cymbals and be able to, peek out, to pick out those frequency peaks that are ringing out above the others. Um, but once you've done it a few times, it's, it's kind of fun. It's almost like a game, I suppose. So having dealt with the EQ on the cymbals channel, we then move on to a bit of compression. And here I'm using this trusty uh, smash and grab compressor set to smash mode with the overhead drum type on the dial. Um, the smash mode, as we've said a few times, is gonna kill some transient information. And if you hear the overhead channel without the compressor, you'll notice especially the snare is peaking very loudly. And um, I mean, that's not the end of the world, but like I mentioned, I particularly want the overhead channels to be like a cymbal mic. And I don't want to be drastically changing the snare sound as I adjust the level of the overhead mic. So for me, it works well to, um, to kind of compress the cymbals anyway to get a bit of extra length out of them, but also to tame the transients off the snare and sometimes the toms too. I'm also taking advantage of the air control here, just a little bit, one and a half dB, um, to give back 
a little bit of the sheen that we all have lost through the low pass filter that I think I had set about 15k um, earlier on in the signal chain. So by cutting that and then boosting it back with this very nice airy sounding EQ, it does give a more consistent shimmer to the cymbal sound, but you have to be really careful. These are very powerful controls. And finally, I'm not actually running this at 100% mix. Um, that can be a bit too aggressive sounding for me. And as you'll see when we move on to the room mics, there's plenty of compression happening there. So this is more about maintaining a really nice consistent vibe um, to the overhead channel. So I'll, I'll first play it bypass, then I'll engage it with 100% mix, and then I'll roll back the mix so you can hear it that way. The big place where you can hear its effect, I think, apart from on the snare drum, is on the initial attack of that, that crash cymbal, which sounds a lot smoother with the compression there. And that makes it more of a kind of wash that will sit into the mix. Uh, finally, I am also sending a little bit of it to the parallel drum compression channel as well. The reason for that is because I do want all of the kit elements to interact with that compressor and the snare drum in particular um, in the parallel compression chain. So I don't leave anything out of it, but I'm not sending anywhere near as much cymbal as I am snare drum, for example. So when it comes to the room mics, I'm not doing very much at all on the individual channels. Um, I am just applying a little bit, well, I'm high pass filtering and also cutting a little bit of presence out of the room mono mic that's quite trashy sounding, as well as a little bit of compression from the smash mode of the, uh, the GGD smash and grab comp. But most of the heavy lifting here is happening on the room bus. So in terms of EQ, I'm cutting quite a lot of low end here. There's a ton of kick drum coming through in the rooms and it's just not really necessary as far as I'm concerned. So I'm, I'm cutting quite a lot of that way. I've got a 120 hertz high pass, but I've, I've turned the cue down quite a lot. So you're seeing it's quite a soft roll off that's reaching really high up into the spectrum. Then giving it a bit of extra aggression around 1.5K. Uh, cutting again, kind of where the cymbals sound really harsh, but then giving it a bit of a kind of glassy sheen up on top. So. So here's the sound of the room mics summed together. Now the most important element in the room mics for me is the snare drum. Uh, what I want to hear above all else is the snare drum kind of explosion expanding into the room. Uh, because it's going to be such a crucial part of getting the snare to sound the way that I want it to sound in the end. For me, rock drums have to have that explosive character with loads of ambience and uh, there's just no substitute for a great sounding drum room on, on snare as far as I'm concerned. So the snare drum is the most important thing. I'm not afraid to shelve away frequencies that are um, perhaps making the cymbals dominate too much. I'm not afraid to get rid of some low end, although you'll notice there's still plenty of kick drum in there. Um, and also I've found that this kind of boost around 1.5K with this particular miking setup that we used is a pleasant place to bring a bit more aggression in the shells without making the cymbals sound too crazy. Uh, however, next up, I am notching the same frequency that I notched in our overhead channel, which is 2750 Hertz. Again, that cymbal whistle coming from the crash uh, is going to be coming through in those room mics too. So. Generally, any notches that I apply to the overheads, I'll apply as well to the room channels. Next up, we've got our good old GGD comp again, this time set to rooms and on smash mode as before. Now, as I've been saying, I really want the snare to cut through loads, but I also want to compress the room mics a little bit to get a bit more of that kind of pumpy character going on. And as I do that, I'm gradually going to reduce the peaks of the snare drums above all else, which um, kind of counteracts what I'm trying to achieve in the end. So a bit like how we have to play with the, the attack quite a lot with the snare drums and toms in particular here, there's kind of um, a little bit of give and take. So first of all, I'm going to compress the rooms quite a lot to get that really thick kind of glued together room sound. And then what I use is quite a nifty trick uh, using this same gate, but set to upward expansion mode. What that's going to mean is uh, it actually, instead of making things quieter when they pass the threshold, makes things louder. And here I'm particularly feeding the snare top channel into the side chain. So basically every time the snare hits, 
it makes the room mics jump up in volume for a certain length of time. In other words, I get back that headroom, that snare kind of poking out above the rest of the kit. Now, obviously when it does this, it is also raising the level of the cymbals and everything else that's in the room mics. But in general, the effect seems to kind of trick the ear into feeling like there's just a lot more snare volume above all else. So um, these two things work together. So what I'm gonna do is first of all, start with no compression, engage the compression. You'll hear how the snare kind of really sits back into the rest of the drum sound. And then I'll engage our uh, upward expansion on the room channel and you'll see how the snare suddenly starts jumping out to the front again. So for me, this, this trick, I guess you'd call it, is such a crucial part to getting room mics to sound the way I want to and to getting my snare drum to sound the way I want it to sound on a, in a drum mix because there's just no other way I've found of getting that same clarity of the snare and the room mics while also getting that really aggressively compressed vibe too. Um, and you'll hear once the whole mix is put together that the snare has this immediate kind of mid-rangey stereo spread to it which is coming from those room mics there uh, it's just a great sound and again the the room here at middle farm is just so fantastic so uh, it's amazing to have it at our disposal here in this program so the much lower dynamic of the verse sections is mirrored in the programming you know the drums are not being hit as hard however there's still a few things that uh, i wanted to do to the drum sound differently during the verse sections in order that it didn't sound quite as uh, quite as explosive i guess because Without the wall of heavy distorted guitars going on that you've got in the intro and chorus, you don't need as much in the way of the drum room in order for it to be audible. You don't have to crank the level of the drum room to anywhere near the same degree. And also, you don't need quite as much of the close mics to be cutting through either. So this is quite a typical thing that I'll do in softer sections in songs. I'll typically leave the overheads as they were, but I'll bring back the volume of the kick drum, the snare, the toms if they're being used in that section but mainly I'll bring back the volume of the rooms quite significantly too. So I'm just gonna pop this into automation mode here and you can see the moves which I've made. So this is my kick drum here, it's dropped about two dB, one and a half dB anyway. Um, the snare, uh, I dropped it about a dB and a half, but I also dropped the amount of it going to the parallel compression by about five dB, four and a half dB. And I reduced the amount of reverb there. So. So what happens is you go into the verse section is it just gets a lot more intimate without the massively explosive sounding room mics, you know, being cranked there. The whole thing gets stripped back and it sounds just a little bit more close and upfront, but not in an aggressive way at all. Uh, with the rooms, I, I brought them back a lot in level. One thing which I did is I favored the room mono mic, which up till now had basically been, well, had been muted. Um, it being mono kind of changes the texture a little bit because you know, it's not like the drums are exploding off to the sides all the time. It kind of keeps them more pinned down the middle of the mix. And I thought that would be a, a cool vibe. It's There's not very much room in there in general for this section, but I thought that having a bit more of a mono room would be cool. Right as this section ends, you've got a big old drum fill that takes you into the chorus. And what I did there actually was a little bit of the opposite. I boosted up the volume of the rooms just for the duration of the fill. And I've also given the actual drum bus a bit of a boost, about a dB in a bit, that lasts just into the beginning of the next section so you get a really loud downbeat into that part too. So um, I'll play just you know from four bars away from the end of the verse. So you'll hear the kind of soft and more intimate vibe of the drums at this point, um, as well as the really huge sounding fill going into the next section. And I'm also gonna mute the vocal submix here so you just listen to the instrumental. So hopefully you get the idea. I'll actually do the same thing with the drums soloed and you'll get, I think, more of an impression of just how it goes from a kind of much tighter and intimate feel to a very huge feel as the, uh, as the snare fill comes in. So automation like this for me is a crucial part of getting sections to flow from one to another really well, 
as well as maintaining um, a good sound because like we've just been talking about, having the room mics cranked in the chorus, for example, sounds great, but would probably be a bit too much in the verse. And while a listener isn't going to notice um, the automation moves that you made necessarily, you know, they, they can be subtle. They can be a lot more subtle than the ones which I've been making here. Um, they might well take them out of the moment if you didn't make those moves, because you might find that the verse just sounds way too overbearing where it should be something a lot more intimate and subtle. So. Uh, definitely don't overlook automation. Once I've got my my mix up on one section of the song, I'll do quite a few passes of the song, just making um, moves from section to section to try, if anything, to maintain a vibe rather than to change it. And I think um, I think that's one of the the biggest parts of getting songs to actually sound complete, as far as I'm concerned. Thanks for watching, and we really hope this has been informative and perhaps might even inspire a little bit of your creative process moving forwards. But in the meantime, for more information, head over to getgooddrums.com.